Please help me in welcoming Maureen Mullen, co-founder and head of research at L2 Incorporated. Thanks, Charles. Um, so what I'm going to take you guys through today is a presentation uh, that I called Observations of a, a Bystander. And um, originally, kind of in November, we were going to release our 2015 digital IQ index for fashion. I think some of you are probably familiar with our rankings. Obviously, kind of that time has come and passed, but going to talk about, I think, four observations that we've seen coming out of fashion, luxury, um, in the digital world that we believe are going to kind of change every business um, in the world today. So just brief background on L2. Um, we do three things, research, benchmarking, and education. Um, all of our research comes out of New York University um, in Manhattan. Um, we benchmark about 1,800 brands across about 10 different categories, do a ton of work in kind of core luxury categories, and going to spend the bulk of my time kind of talking about that today. And what we do for organizations is we're effectively looking at their digital footprint across about 1,250 data points, the site and e-commerce experience, digital marketing, social media, and mobile. And what we're able to do is clearly articulate where an organization is strong and weak versus their competitive set. So this was actually our sixth annual digital IQ index for fashion. And if you look at the ranking, and I'm going to go through this ridiculously fast. Um, so this is starting at the bottom. I promise fast. You guys can look at the printout um, to get a sense of uh, who took some of the top spots. Um, but effectively, when you look at what's happened with the fashion industry, we've been measuring brands in fashion since 2009. Fashion has moved from an industry that we would say was a significant laggard to one in several areas that we would actually say is leading from a digital perspective. And a lot of that um, is on the content side. A lot of that is on the great use of new and up and coming social media platforms. Still some work to do on e-commerce, omnichannel, and what we would say is best-in-class customer experience. Um, when we look at the Genius brand, so Kate Spade playing a little bit more in the mass stage space, has done a fantastic job at great search engine optimization. Really that omni-channel connective tissue between their stores and their digital presence. And we would argue does digital creative better than anyone. And then the number one spot, and I, I always hate to be the person to talk about Burberry uh, in the context of digital, because I think it's overdone. And I would argue the only department that's stronger than Burberry's digital department is Burberry's PR team that does a fantastic job of highlighting uh, what they do. But to Burberry's credit, you know, they've gotten a lot of accolades around their Facebook pages and Art of the Trench. I think what Burberry has done better than anyone, and you see this in a lot of their annual reporting, is really linking the investments that they're making in a digital world to what's happening everywhere else. Um, and they have absolutely seamless customer service across each of the sites that they've launched. Um, they're one of the few fashion brands that actually does have much more endless inventory that they can source um, from a global perspective. And have done a great job on some of that omni-channel integration, getting product into consumers' hands from stores as quickly as possible. So some observations. Uh, the first is around enterprise value, because what's happened in the last 20 years kind of in the luxury industry has obviously been the emergence of these large enterprise conglomerates, where the, the, the whole thinking is, is that the whole is going to be greater than the sum of its parts. That hasn't necessarily played out from a digital perspective. What we're looking at here is the individual digital IQ scores of brands within the fashion industry and how they rank by enterprise. So here you have Jab Holdings, uh, formerly Labalux, so Bali, uh, Bell Staff, Jimmy Choo, Caring Group, LVMH, Richemont, very small fashion portfolio. This is just looking at fashion, and then Pooj. And what you can see with organizations such as LVMH is that you have genius brands, and feeble digital brands effectively sitting within the same building. So all of the enterprise scale that LVMH has been able to build around real estate, around media, hasn't necessarily translated to digital. You see this play out, so we're gonna look a little bit at e-commerce. When you look at what's happened from an e-commerce perspective in luxury, still a relatively small fraction of the overall business, but has accounted for about 60% of the growth year over year. So absolute luxury kind of at the highest price point 
is at about 3.5%, 3.6%. Now, as you go into the mass stage and you look at the coaches and the Kate Spades, that's where those numbers get driven up significantly. So let's look at LVMH versus caring. And there's a lot of data on this slide. You also have it on your printout. What's interesting, this is an aggregate of their performance across all of these different data points that we measure. And what you see here in site and e-commerce, so this is the area where the UCS partnership has been put in place for caring. Um, you see they have a sizable advantage across a lot of those areas that have been standardized across their sites. LVMH does not have kind of a common technology infrastructure that supports their e-commerce experiences. Now, when you look at things that are more controlled by brand on a brand by brand basis, like social media, you can see the organizations kind of performing almost at parity. Let's look a little bit at some of the history of what's happened. So if you look at caring, you have Gucci, who we heard from yesterday, super early innovator, and I think has continued to be one of the leaders uh, from an e-commerce perspective, their most recent launch of their site is one of the first sites that actually does provide kind of seamless inventory integration and very much highlights that personal shopper. And then you can see um, the majority of their fashion portfolio rolling out around 2008 and then being standardized kind of with the, the UCS partnership in 2012. LVMH much more all over the map. And you have iconic brands like Fendi who didn't launch e-commerce. Now did, I, I would argue, um, make a significant step change with their launch, but didn't launch online until 2015. And then still a ton of brands uh, for LVMH from a fashion perspective that are not selling. The interesting dark horse, um, who we would argue has gone from one of the industry's biggest laggards to a leader from an enterprise value perspective has been Richemont. Um, and Richemont has been quite consistent, um, kind of coming out of 2010, 2011, getting best in class e-commerce experiences, but also concierge experiences that dr drive to their boutiques. And Richemont kind of crossed a critical threshold in 2011, where more than 50% of their business was done via vertical channels. And through the CRM activations and through some of the things that they've been able to do, we would argue digital has been a big part of that. Now, we have reason to believe that LVMH may be poised for change. And in October, they made a huge hiring announcement um, with Ian Rogers, who they poached from uh, Beats by Dr. Dre, not a traditional um, LVMH hire. And one of the few firms that's actually been able to take um, human capital out of uh, some of the great uh, technology firms in the Bay Area. Um, a lot of evidence to suggest they're taking much more of an enterprise approach and it's going to be inter interesting to watch over the course of the year. Next uh, observation, the most powerful platform in the world, and we've heard a lot about it and seen a lot about it, but if you look at what's happened with Instagram, this is the share of interactions across global social media in the beauty industry happening on Instagram. 90% of all likes, comments, and shares now occur on Instagram um, from a branded content perspective in beauty. Furthermore, we, we heard a little bit um, from John Dempsey about some of the disruptors within the industry. If you look at what's happening from an engagement perspective, one brand in beauty, a small makeup artist brand out of Los Angeles called Anastasia Beverly Hills, which relies almost entirely on user-generated content, now controls 34% of all interactions on Instagram. If you look at that, that's more than Estee Lauder and LVMH combined. Now, not coincidentally, what is the fastest growing brand per NPD data in the US market? Anastasia Beverly Hills, now doing over 500 million in sales. And if you haven't heard of the brand here in Europe, watch out. About 50% of their influencer content is actually influencers outside of the US, which they've used to scale the business. Similarly, you look at the fashion numbers, 90% of all interactions. And if you look at the brand that controls the highest percentage of interactions in, in fashion, Valentino at 9%. And, you, and we've all kind of seen the success of Valentino kind of within the marketplace. We get a ton of questions around what content really resonates on Instagram. And there's been a lot of talk, I think, across the course of the conference around the creative model. What, what we've seen and we see consistently across luxury industries is telling brands and product stories in differentiated ways. You do not have to make these big jumps into lifestyle content. This is all product story. This is some of the, the, the content that Valentino has gotten some of the highest interaction on. And we see, we've seen that that's correlated with growth. 
We always get asked, is user-generated content right for a luxury brand? How much of this content, this is content that's on the Four Seasons e-commerce site, how much of this content do you guys believe is user-generated? So it's, they do such a good job that about half of it is user-generated and half of it is brand-controlled. They've done it, and I think that is a key for luxury brands. It's not necessarily that you can't open your organization up to other creative direction. It's that you have to stay consistent with those brand codes, and you see that with Four Seasons. Um, we're going to talk a, a little bit about Amazon. Um, why are we talking about Amazon at a luxury conference? If you look at the fastest growing platform for apparel right now, it's Amazon.com up 91%. Um, apparel is growing faster on Amazon than you see than almost any other category, including consumer electronics. Uh, in the US, Amazon is going to be the largest apparel retailer, not the largest online apparel retailer, the largest apparel retailer surpassing Macy's, Nordstrom, and a handful of other players by the end of this year. Now, the scary thing that's happened over the course of holiday of 2015 is as the US department store business was down significantly, you see all sorts of players, the PVHs, the Ralph Lauren's, the Michael Kors, the Kate Spades, getting on that plane out to Seattle and starting to have conversations with Jeff Bezos. Here you can see what hap what's happening on the Amazon platform for Michael Kors. Um, over 9,000 different products. And a lot of organizations are starting to seriously consider kind of distributing um, officially, which will have a huge impact, not only on uh, fashion, but also, I think, uh, cascading down to beauty and other categories. Um, when you look at the consumer experience, we talk about best-in-class service experiences. Um, this bag can be purchased for 30% off and re it received within two days. On the Michael Kors site, the consumer not only pays more, but they also wait longer. Um, and Amazon, I don't think this is a huge threat to luxury fashion, but it's definitely disruptive to the industry, is going into the fashion business itself with a host of private label brands. Final observation, we, would, we believe kind of the best luxury brand in the world is not actually in the room today, and we would argue that brand is Apple. And we think Apple is the single biggest threat to virtually every organization in the room. Um, someone said yesterday that the Apple Watch was a failure, and the media loves winners and losers. We never see kind of an article, front page of the New York Times, Apple Watch sales just okay. Um, and when you look at kind of Apple's failure, um, Apple single-handedly came in to the smartwatch market and was able to effectively steal all of Samsung's market share. So this looks at what happened after the Apple Watch launched. Apple went from 0% to 74% market share within that category. And you can say, okay, well, smartwatch is a relatively small overall market. This is looking at the smartwatch shipments compared to the, uh, the entire Swiss watch export market in Q4 of 2015. Apple, um, with, its, uh, with its launch, did an estimated five billion in its first nine months. I would like to challenge any brand in the room to call a product launch that did five billion in nine months a failure. Also, I think more evidence that Apple is uh, moving into the luxury, uh, luxury industry. Can you think of another brand that Hermes would partner with? I think this signals kind of how, how much this industry has changed. Um, most uh, substantial product of our decade, if you look at what's happened in the smartphone wa uh, market, Apple controls 92% of overall profits. Samsung's at 15%, you can say, wait, that data doesn't necessarily make sense. But you have everybody else effectively kind of competing over the losses. Now, this is, that, this is incredibly relevant to you guys because if you look at Apple's positioning, Apple has the volumes of Ford. They're the number one highest volume smartphone in the world, but the margins of Ferrari. It's the highest priced point um, items. They have huge efficiencies on the, supplier on the supplier negotiations, on materials, and what is translated into just ridiculous operating margins. So they have higher operating margins than effectively um, any of the three largest luxury groups. To put into context Apple's growth, Apple grew 51 billion last year. 
That means they added the equivalent of Louis Vuitton, Caring Group, Richemont, Michael Kors, Coach, Hermes, and Prada to their top line. When one company is taking 51 billion in discretionary purchasing power out of the ecosystem, who does that hurt? It effectively hurts everyone. Final slide here. Um, I think when you, somebody mentioned this yesterday, but I think the top luxury brand in China, everybody's having domestic slowdown. Apple's business has been up a staggering kind of 60 to 90% every quarter kind of within, within China. So I think in sum, when you look at kind of the host of competitors, you look at the opportunities from digital in a luxury standpoint, I think it's really important to look at what's going on within this room, but it's also, I think, equally important to kind of look at what's going on outside. Thank you for your time today.